Hello, hello. Welcome to Chess Openings Explained. It's me, Nick Risco, your instructor for tonight. And we are back here live in the St. Louis Chess Club studio. Now, the question that we're going to be aiming to answer over the next probably two months is, are you a real Chess Openings Explained lecturer if you don't have a 10-part series? That's what we're going to be getting into right now with part one of a series over the Scotch, the Scotch game, Gambit, and all other openings falling uh, in that category. So we're actually going to be starting with um, a lot of the sidelines first here. Uh, mainly tonight our focus is going to be on third move deviations or uh, weird third move sidelines that black can get into after the opening moves. So let's get right into it. We have pawn to e4, pawn to e5, knight to f3, knight to c6, and pawn to d4. And this is the scotch opening. Uh, so here the idea is uh, you're, you're playing d4, you're going to open it up. Um, I guess the, the drawback to this compared to other moves, uh, I guess like bishop c4 or bishop b5, the Spanish and the Italian openings, is that d4 is not as well prepared. Uh, black can just liquidate right away on d4 and white is going to not be as a head in development and stuff like that. So it's going to be a little bit slower. Just want to thank uh, Final Monkey for the sub here. All right, so we have d4, and the first move we're going to be looking at is uh, probably one that's very easily dealt with, is pawn to d5. Uh, here, black is trying to create complications in the center at the cost of potentially losing this e-pawn. And the way that white punishes this is just by snapping it off. And we're going to go with the knight here. We're not going to go with the pawn, uh, mainly because black can, can probably just take and get into uh, just an end game that isn't, you know, horrible for them. Um, maybe something like knight to g5 here and maybe even knight h6, just protecting f7, and then we see a trade of pawns in the center. Now, by, by no means am I claiming that these are the best moves for both sides, but white does have better after knight takes e5. Really, the only way that black can try and make progress here in the center is if they trade knights. Black does have this option of taking on e4, which has been growing in popularity recently, but this is pretty easily dealt with. Uh, one way that white can reduce this uh, tension in the center is by playing bishop to b5, pinning this knight to the king. And the only way to break this tension is to play bishop d7. And after bishop to d7, white has this nice move. Knight takes d7, not only winning the bishop pair, which can be of some use in an open position, but now reintroducing the pin completely as now if the knight moves, the queen is attacked. And here, white just simply defends their center pawn. And if black continues developing, white can just castle safely. And bishop to d6 is a good developing move. But now white has the time to go knight d2. And after black castles, one key idea white uh, should remember here is that they can actually play f3. Uh, we've been told time and time again by a certain grandmaster, uh, never play f3 or f6. But here it's actually a pretty good idea to chip away at whatever center control black has left here with their pawns. And if they take, which I, I think is probably the best decision to go with, um, then white can recapture with the knight. And white has this uh, nice space advantage here in the center. The bishops are open. This other bishop can drop back and point at the king side. The knight's ready to hop in. I think all these moves are very natural for white and shouldn't require too much thought about um so they could take on e4 but i think white's position is just super easy i think the one that uh, could potentially give problems if white is unprepared is knight takes e5 and d takes e5 and now black does best by capturing on e4 offering up the trade of queens now as white we should accept this our opponent is offering us to give up his castling rights we might as well take advantage of that uh, but now knight c3, and white's already putting pressure on the position. This e-pawn is likely to fall. And if black plays something supernatural like bishop to b4, 
white has this uh pretty nice line here bishop g5 check and it's very important that black chooses the correct move here if black tries to play knight e7 with the idea of developing this leads into a completely lost position because now white has castles with check which breaks this pin the bishop had so now after the king goes to e8 uh, white can just take on e4 for free and this bishop really has no purpose here anymore and these kingside pawns are likely to roll forward so black needs to be very careful they they do need to play king e8 otherwise they are going to be running into castles long with check uh, but now here it comes without check and black could capture on c3 if they want to double up white's pawns but i think it's a little bit more important that they focus on their development so i recommend bishop to g4 bishop to b5 check and uh now after c6 just drop the bishop back to e2 you're likely to trade off at least one set of minor pieces whether that is with the bishop uh taking on c3 and you take on g4 this is how you don't lose material or whether it's bishop takes e2 and knight takes e2 and then this e pawn is going to be a weakness forever so i think here already move three whenever black plays d5 pretty easy for white to get around nothing too terribly sharp and complicated so that is our first sideline the next one we're going to look at is after e4 e5 knight f3 knight c6 d4 is knight f6 now this one does look very natural for black i would not blame any of my opponents playing this move it looks very natural developing but i think i feel like this is also very easily remedied just by simply pushing the pawn you push the pawn to d5 and now you're asking black hey where are you going to put your knight that's on c6 and it's not quite so clear at first glance um, you're also forcing black to move their knight again so they're wasting time by moving the same pieces over and over again and now we'll start getting into where does the knight actually go uh, you cannot go to d4 even though it looks good you're centralizing your knight you are hanging a pawn after knight d4 knight d4 or sorry e d4 and queen d4 you're just giving up a pawn for free and now white's queen is centralized there's no way you can punish white for this because your knight is no longer on b8 able to come to c6 and kick it um, and really there's no pressure on e4 it can easily be defended by bishop d3 knight c3 or even knight d2 f3 is even possible if e4 faces any kind of pressure at all so knight d4 uh, is a big blunder here you do have other moves though that do require some consideration knight b8 is a popular one and probably a good try for black here uh, if they find themselves in this position white can take on e5 with the knight but they do need to be aware that they can't just expect to win this pawn completely for free you are going to have to do a little bit of defending of your center here because queen e7 not only hits the knight but if you move the knight away uh, you're actually going to be losing the center pawn so it would actually be a trade of pawns instead of you just winning on e5 so i would recommend defending your knight with queen to d4 again it, it's not any danger because the pawn on d5 stops this knight from coming to c6 and now after something like pawn d6 the point is kicking the knight so they can take on e4 you have this in between move here very important develop while you can bishop b5 check you get this piece out of the way and you're getting ready to castle uh and here the best move for black is actually king to d8 if you don't play king to d8 and let's say you block with your other knight white already has a fantastic position because their knight that is attacked on e5 can trade itself off for whatever is on d7 so uh, they can't exactly just block on d7 white is going to end up having a very uh, nice center extra pawn uh, if there's ever a block so they do have to go king d8 just to avoid any material deficiencies and now white can retreat the knight and black will capture with the queen i do want to point out it is not possible for black to capture with the knight uh, even though it does look good it, uh, it looks a bit more natural avoiding putting the queen out in the center 
and black may have the idea, hey, I don't want to trade queens. I want to keep queens on the board so I can generate chances later. But this is actually a blunder, uh, and not for the most clear move. It's actually castles. And what the point of castling is, is that you want to play rook to e1. You're pinning the knight to the queen. And let's say the knight moves. Let's say knight f6. Or uh, how about this? this may even illustrate the purpose even better. If knight g5, rook e1, well, okay, this doesn't work. Uh, I'm now realizing there's a flaw in my line. Let's say this move doesn't exist. I'm just, I'm just trying to illustrate a purpose here. Uh, if black tries to go for a queen trade here, there's also this mate. It's uh, the opera mate, the opera pattern. So uh, that's just for illustrative purposes. If they go knight g5, you should clearly take with the bishop. Um, but just putting the rook on e1 is definitely a major goal of whites trying to pin the knight and also get behind the queen for this mate idea. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of people in the comments section here. Um, let's see, Implicance is saying sometimes you get a one pawn advantage and trade everything. I, I don't think that's how we're going to be looking at it. So in some of these lines, white does gain a pawn. Uh, the idea isn't just to trade everything off because then you won't have any pieces left to help that one pawn promote. Um, but our idea here is to use this extra pawn for a space advantage or something of the likes. Okay, so uh, we went over why knight to e4 doesn't work and just some other lines to illustrate this purpose. If they go f5 trying to protect the knight, this runs into rook e1. And if a6, there's actually... A very nice sacrifice, rook takes e4, f takes e4, and bishop to g5, pinning the queen to the king, defended by the knight, and white will actually come out on top here, despite two minor pieces being attacked and sacrificing an exchange. Uh, if black decides to play c5 and attack the queen instead, this one's also pretty easy to deal with. You take on c6 with en passant, and then after the pawn recaptures, you still have rook to e1 hitting the knight. And if they take the bishop, well here, rook takes on e4 is going to be crushing. Queen to d7, bishop to g5, check. And the last little trick here, if they block with f6, you can actually just take on f6 with the bishop. If the pawn takes back, you have this very nice fork. So this is all why... Black must capture with the queen. Otherwise, castling just why has too much peace activity. But if black captures with the queen and we go with a queen trade here, this position is uh, relatively balanced. Uh, we castle here as white and black can play a6 and white can retreat the bishop pretty much to anywhere. Um, but I think bishop c4 is the idea. Trying to uh, avoid this bishop d3 met by knight c5 idea here so i think this is actually a way for for black to play if they find themselves in this situation knight b8 um white can enjoy a comfortable game i don't think black poses any problems at any point uh what else does black have here well uh it looks like they have knight to e7 and i actually played a couple games against uh other people here at the chess club today just to see what they would play and knight to e7 was uh, almost always the instinct. Um, so if this is a blitz game and your opponent is ill-prepared, knight e7 is probably the expected move. Now after knight e7, you do get to capture on e5. Um, there is no queen e7 trying to put pressure on the e-file, so you do get this pawn. But in turn, black will capture on e4. Now here, engines will recommend moves like queen e2 or bishop d3. But one move that I really like and one move that uh, I thought of that reminded me of my Vienna lecture is queen to f3. And while, again, it's not the engine's top choice, the engine still likes it and it has some trickiness. It's actually not the easiest to defend with black here. If you go with the natural knight to f6, well, black could be facing problems after knight c3. And already it's pretty hard to tell how black is supposed to develop their pieces. Um, if you go with this natural looking d6, whew, well, black can resign. 
After d6, you have this very nice bishop b5 check coming in on the diagonal. And suddenly you realize black is going to be losing a lot of material, either their queen or I believe it's their, their rook and a bishop. But if you look here, black, if they block with the bishop, is met by bishop takes bishop. And if the knight takes, there's a very nice checkmate in one. If the queen takes on d7, then knight takes d7, and suddenly you realize white is just up a queen. And if you decide to block with, I guess you block with knight d7 first. This is still checkmate in one. But if you block with the pawn, well, d takes c6 is the winning continuation here. After d c6, if they take with the pawn, then knight takes c6, and you're going to end up with this fork. Um, I guess bishop takes c6 is also winning because you have queen takes c6 resulting in this idea. Um, and yeah, if they decide to play something like, I don't know, they can try a6 getting the bishop, but this is met by either c takes b7 where you're going to take the rook and promote, or just c7 check and you're going to win a queen this way. So lots of problems for black now. D6 is not forced by any means. There are still moves here, but there's a lot of moves here that also make mistakes. Like B6, if you're trying to develop your light squared bishop this way, runs into pawn D6 where it hits the knight and your queen is hitting this rook. Uh, this is definitely one of those puzzle rush tactics. Okay, so if D6 and B6 don't work, we can't develop our light squared bishop. Let's focus on developing our dark square bishop. Well, you can't play g6 because you hang your knight. So um, really there's only one way to develop and that is knight to g6. This is probably the only way to develop without losing material and try and stay on pace with white's, um, white's development here. So knight g6, very easily met with knight takes g6 and now hg6. And white doesn't have to do anything special here. Their pawn on d5 is clearly well defended by the knight and the, the queen. So even a move like bishop d2 is perfectly fine. Uh, you might run into bishop c5. It's no problem. The queen's protecting. And now white just castles. And white enjoys very natural development. So this bishop can come to c4, maybe even d3. And white also has nice space with this pawn on d5. While black is still going to be struggling with how they're going to be developing this light squared bishop so i think that uh this this uh idea here by black is refuted with knight e7 and then after you take they take on e4 what are some other ideas black has really there's only one other idea and that is knight to a5 putting the knight on the edge of the board and you know what because we're live, I'm going to ask the audience, what move do you think is the best in this position? may not be uh, clear. The uh, engine number one move is definitely not, <laughs> was not one of my candidates. But I want to see what uh, the audience can come up with here. Tasha one says, hey, I'm now 2100 rated player in Lee Chess. Tell me, how do I improve my rating? Well, it's going to be uh, probably tactics and end games. I know whenever I was 2100, at least in classical, uh, I studied my end games and uh, my openings as well and was able to add a couple hundred more ELO on top of that. No guesses from the audience. All right, well, if we don't have any guesses from the audience, all right, someone's using an engine or they've looked at this position before. <laughs> uh, but yes, the uh, the move here, the top move is A3. Now, what is the idea of A3? This looks like it does nothing to contribute to White's position. Right? What piece is this developing? How does this like influence our center at all? Why are we not just taking this pawn on e5 well that last question we can answer uh, already from looking at our other line if knight takes e5 we do run into some tricks with queen to e7 um, but here white actually throws in this move a3 with a very clear threat 
before trapping the knight. So if black decides, all right, I'm going to go d6, solidify my center, open up my bishop. Well, all right, I'll, I'll just uh, attack your knight. He has nowhere to go, and uh, I get a free horse. So after white plays a3, this actually prompts black to play only one move, and that is b6. There really is no other way to save your knight, and the point is that if b4 right away, then you can tuck the knight on b7. So this is the point of b6. And I have to be honest, after b6, I didn't really know what to recommend. It seemed like Masters, or maybe it wasn't even Master games, but uh, it seems like here most people who reached this position played knight b to d2. Uh, even though the engine heavily prefers moves like knight takes e5 and knight c3. So I was looking around, and uh, I'll show you both of the lines because they're very similar. It's the same idea. Um, but we'll take a look at knight b to d2 because this is what most people play. Uh, and it really depends on where you want your bishop. But after knight to d2, uh, now black does have time to play d6. And after d6, we can play b4, kick the knight back to b7. And our idea here is to go bishop a6. And what this does is it prevents black's bishop from developing. This really ties down black's pieces. You have this knight on b7 that can't go anywhere. This bishop on c8 is defending this knight. So uh, black's really hurting here on the queen side as far as the, the movability of their pieces. So now like queen d7 trying to <laughs> just get some kind of play. Maybe queen a4 is an idea. Uh, but after queen d7... I, I, most people play queen e2 here and then knight to d8 so creating this square for the knight uh, offering a trade of bishops uh, but here white doesn't have to take um, it can seem very natural just to take on c8 and then rook takes c8 and now black's ready to play c5 i highly recommend not doing this and the point isn't that you know uh, you just want to keep the bishop just to keep a bishop but if you retreat this bishop back to d3, just solidify your center, white has a lot of space with this pawn on d5. Um, this bishop is keeping the position solid, whereas black's bishop, what is it doing? It can't go to a6 because of the bishop. It can't, well, okay, it can go to b7, but it's not doing anything on b7. It's hitting the, uh, these pawns in the center and will barely have any influence. If you're going to go bishop b7, it's so you can play c6 and chip away at the center. Um, but even this idea, which we will see in just a second, um, is just uh, uh, met with c4. Um, let's see, in the chat, uh, someone's saying bishop b5 looks like it's winning. Unfortunately, it's not. They can block with c6. So they do block with c6. You can take with the pawn. It can be met with, uh, I believe, knight takes. Um, but something like bishop a4, or again, just retreating, you can take if you want. Um, but knight takes c6, and black is doing just fine. You start opening up this position, and now this knight that was stuck on d8 um, is starting to get into the game. But uh, very nice observation. Um, this is something you could try try to do. Um, but yeah, queen e2, knight d8, bishop d3. And now black finishes development, and once we look at this position, we realize white is just dominating on the queen side here with the space. And uh, again, if uh, black tries to go c6, we, we just meet it with c4. And really the only other idea black has here is to try and play a5 and break on the queen side. And if they ever play a5 trying to chip away, you just play rook b1 and defend. And yeah, black gets this a file, but it's not really doing much for them. And if they try to just go like rook a2, you have rook b2 offering the trade. And white is happy here. Now your rook is going to get to a1. So I think um, this might be tough for black to play. I think it's doable, but it might be tough. Um, I'll also show what happens if the knight goes to c3. Again, it's pretty much the same idea, except here with knight to c3, instead of trying to go like bishop to d, or sorry, b2, um now the bishop is likely to go to g5 so i think it's really up to you on where you want your bishop to go uh, if you want your bishop to come here to g5 go knight c3 if you're looking more at bishop to b2 
then I believe knight b to d2 is better. But yeah, here if they go d6, you kick the knight again, and bishop to a6, um, and both sides complete their development. Pretty natural moves from both sides. Uh, again, not trading off the light squared bishops. And I think this is fine for white. Uh, and engines just saying white is white is doing great, uh, mainly because black can't really do anything on the queen side here. So that is uh, here third move knight to f6. Uh, and that pretty much sums it up. d5, really, they only have those options with the knight. Okay, our next sideline is going to be 3d6. Okay, so this can also be reached from a Philidor move order. Um, so if you play knight f3 and your opponent plays d6, you can still go d4 and you can reach the same position after they play knight to c6. Now here you do have a few different options. Uh, one that people may be looking at right away is pawn takes e5. And what this is going to do is trade into an end game. This is completely fine and playable, but I find the end game to actually be uh, pretty okay for black in this position. I don't think there's anything, you know, I don't think there's any major problems for black other than they're a move behind. So you do have this option if you want to just outplay your opponent in an end game. Otherwise, you have two other options. You can go bishop to b5, and what this does is it transposes into a, uh, well, it's hard to say if this transposes into the Steinitz of the Rui Lopez, or if the Rui Lopez transposes to this line in the Scotch, but you have bishop to b5, and here the point is after takes, takes, and bishop to d7, you can go knight c3, and black's most played idea here is g6. Uh, trying to fiend keto the bishop and I don't think white's moves are too terribly difficult here bishop to e3 developing almost like a Yugoslav setup from the dragon and now if they're bishop g7 queen d2 no need to worry about f3 there's no knight trying to come to g4 you have knight f6 now the knight can be trying to go to g4 but white has some moves that can gain them a little bit of time, starting with bishop takes c6, doubling up the pawns. If the bishop takes, now you can play f3 because e4 is under fire. You stop the knight from coming to g4 and trying to trade off for this attacking bishop. But most commonly played is b takes and bishop to h6, already trying to trade off this uh, nice defending piece. So you see castles, trade of bishops, and after castles long, I think white's position is completely fine you have two knights that are centralized black's structure is weakened um and white can play something like f3 they also have h4 h5 trying to crash through on the king side um yeah you play this kind of like um almost like a, a dragon but that that should be good for white as well uh, but i think my main recommendation is actually going to be this idea i think you saw it in the uh the chessable scotch course here um but d5 and i think d5 is a rather forcing line which should be easy to remember after d5 um this knight does have a decision to make where does it go and again most commonly this knight is going to go back to e7 you can't go to d4 again just because of takes takes and takes and you're down a pawn so you go back to e7 and there's a couple tries here. Uh, white should go c4, solidify the center. And I think black has actually two tries here, um, which in the, uh, I think the course I was looking at said knight f6 is the main move, and it is. We'll take a look at that. This is definitely the most played. But uh, again, I was doing some games against some members of the club earlier today, and f5 was tried a couple times. And I thought this was very interesting. Uh, it almost looked like a very real threat that uh, black is actually just expanding on the king side and getting completely fine development. But uh, I think it's very interesting here. We have knight to c3 defending the pawn, knight to f6 attacking the pawn again, and 
maybe a little counterintuitive. You should play e takes f5. And if bishop takes f5, you start with this move h3. And the point of h3 is to stop anything from coming to g4 and hurting your position. And after h3, black has like two ideas, not, really not even two ideas. One idea was g6 to go bishop to g7, but already white has this pretty awesome looking g4. And after bishop to d7, uh, bishop to g2, computers are already giving this an evaluation of plus two. I think personally that might be a little ambitious um, because I think it's easy for white to play passive moves and slip into a more balanced position. But for example, bishop to g7 is met with knight to g5. Uh, first off, one idea is to go to e6, but also you're looking to go to e4 and trade off one of your knights for this knight on f6. I think this knight on f6 is probably black's best minor piece and trading off one of your knights for it shouldn't hurt your position. If black tries to kick it with h6, yeah, you just go knight g e4. And uh, <laughs> the idea that was tried in the game was uh, knight to g8, and here white can go with c5, start smashing through the center, and this may start to look like a king's indian defense gone wrong. Um, this is something that black wants to avoid at all costs. We see this trade... And now you can't just take on c5 because of bishop g6. Um, it, it's very weakening for black. Don't play like this, please. Uh, instead, if you are playing like this as black, first off, reconsider your openings. But if you have this position, play c6. Uh, and after white plays bishop to e2, uh, takes on d5. Very important, take with the pawn. Use this pawn to cement this structure in the center and secure your space advantage. Um, and, and this should be enough to counter this f5 idea by black. Black's going to have a bit of a hard time getting this dark square bishop developed and sometimes may even need to castle long. So f5, very interesting. Do I think it's great? I don't think so. So we're gonna look at knight f6. This is more popular, it's more solid. We go knight c3, defending our pawn on e4. And again, two ideas here. Uh, we have knight to g6, which we saw in some of our other lines, trying to develop this bishop to e7. And we also have pawn to g6, trying to develop this way. Now g6 actually works a little bit better here, um, earlier rather than later. And it basically goes into a king's Indian defense, but I think white is further ahead in their plan for instance after g6 white can play c5 right away which is like usually a break they're saving for the middle game in a king's indian defense but they just hit black with it right away and there's there's a couple things here one if bishop g7 right away you can take on d6 and then you go queen queen a4 and either minor piece if either minor piece blocks, you move the queen to b4 and you're putting pressure on b7 and d6. Um, whereas if queen a4 and queen d7 uh, loses instantly because of bishop b5. So bishop g7 could run into some problems. Um, definitely some pressure on the queen side. Instead, I think they should take on c5 which um, is a little unfortunate because this is what white wants. And after d takes c5, bishop to e3, you're just putting pressure on the pawns. And while knight d7 looks like it's going to hold, white is going to get some nice play here, starting with bishop to c4. And after bishop to g7, uh, I think this move d6 is pretty nice. You're pushing the pawn forward, attacking the knight. The knight doesn't really have anywhere great to go. If it goes to c6, um, it's actually losing for black because of bishop f7. And if the king takes, the point is knight g5, king e8, and then knight e6. Kind of trapping the queen here. And if you move the queen to safety, well now, um, well first there's knight d5 hitting it again. And if they take your knight, you win the queen or even just knight c7 right away should be good enough. <clears throat> so here, black really should take. 
and after taking there is queen d6 and now both of these pawns are going to be facing massive pressure from white's knight and the queen plus this bishop on e3 uh black can try castling getting out of it uh, but white is going to get a lot of pressure after castling queen side getting a lot of pressure on this d file um now here queen e8 might be an idea by black trying to break this pin so you can move the knight but this is actually met with knight to b5 which is pretty strong going to c6 and i don't see a great way to stop this so uh rather than queen to e8 we have knight to c6 and now the only move that will secure white a huge advantage is knight to d5 and there's quite a quite a bit of ideas here um, but I'll, I'll give an illustrative line of knight to b6 looking for the queen trade you give it to them and now uh, knight to e7 is actually going to give you the material advantage rather than just a positional advantage king to f8 you have knight c6 and uh, now you get this pawn on c5 and here black's structure is uh, not exactly fun uh, white does have the better structure and after king e8 and bishop to b3 oh boy i did put a lot of arrows on here um you'll see all of white's pieces are very good the bishops are very active this knight is putting pressure on e5 whereas black's knight has nowhere to go and their bishop is blocked in by their own pawn so uh it's not a huge surprise that the engine prefers white here um okay what else do they have um do, do, do not this g6 idea but rather knight g6 this is what we're going to get into all right so we see knight g6 and the point is getting the bishop to e7 so here the way that i think white should should go um most players have played bishop to e2 this is by far the most common move but it's not very ambitious after bishop to e2 you're not really posing any threats to your opponent you're just kind of you know developing which isn't bad but is very passive and if you keep playing normal moves then black can equalize rather quickly um and the game will follow kind of the style of a king's indian defense um black is doing just fine here with a balanced position i think more ambitious is h4 right away you're threatening h5 which is going to hit the knight yet again and black has already spent you know however many tempo moving the knights they really can't afford to allow h5 uh, so they play bishop to g4 which not only introduces this pin but it also stops white from playing h5 and in the chessable course that i was looking at i was recommending bishop to e2 but i think i found a little improvement here um is actually going g3 first uh you don't need to play bishop e2 the pin is nothing to worry about the knight is defended and after g3 black's best move is bishop to e7 looking to castle uh now you play bishop to e2 and really what black has to do is um if they try c6 you can develop like normal i think this transposes to to the line in trustable but um if they try a6 i think is the idea that they can go with uh you also have this idea of knight to h2 forcing a trade of light squared bishops if they don't take the trade and they go back to d7 h5 is going to get through this isn't exactly fun so takes on e2 and now queen takes on e2 and what white has accomplished here is they've traded off a a bit of an annoying piece their light squared bishop because with all these pawns on light squares in the center you don't want that bishop on the light squares your pawns are going to obstruct it and i think white has guaranteed themselves uh, probably the best minor pieces they can have and black is left with this bishop that's on the same color as their center pawns so that's what white has accomplished here and i think black can get away with h6 or um probably even castling um well maybe not castling because of h5 um but something like c6 or h6 should be um 
playable for black, but this position does lend itself to white. And uh, here we actually, after Queen E2, does follow a game um, back from 1997 between two 2200s, uh, Biro Martiska. But I did want to show this because uh, this is also a line you can get from the Philidor. You can get similar positions from the Steinitz. Uh, but I did want to show that uh, you do have this extra option of d5. Okay. Our last set of sidelines here is actually going to all come from the same third move, but they're going to be um, three different systems. Uh, so here we're going to be looking at, uh, on move number three, black captures on d4, not with the pawn, because that's the main line. We're looking at sidelines tonight. They're going to capture on d4 with the knight. And... Some would say this is already a big mistake by Black. It's not a mistake in the way the computer would evaluate it, but Black definitely has better options than just trading this knight right away. And the first system we're going to look at for White is just capturing on e5. This seems very natural. We just lost a pawn. We're going to gain it back, and now we have tempo on the knight. Black has to respond to this, and almost universally, uh, black plays knight to e6 here. Um, it should be noted if they go to c6, white should take. If d takes, then you get into an end game where white can castle. Um, but if b takes, then knight c3 should be slightly better for white. But okay, knight e6. <clears throat> And I gotta be honest, this one was the one I was struggling the most to try and find a way to punish and refute. And I, I have to come and be honest, I, I could not find just this awesome smashing system for white. But I did find a pretty easy system for white that uh, can't really be refuted. Is uh, G3. After G3 here, um, you're looking to go bishop to G2 knight to c3 and our sample line here black plays d6 hitting the knight opening up the bishop you go knight to d3 uh, the point is that way you leave this open for your bishop in the future and now knight f6 hitting the pawn no worries you just play bishop to g2 defending and c6 c6 might look a little strange but black may want to break with d5 one day and you're also you know if white can ever get e5 through kind of shutting down this diagonal in advance. So c6 makes a bit of sense here. Uh, white can continue with knight c3, bishop to e7, and castles by both sides. And this is pretty pretty balanced, but unfortunately, again, I, I have to say, I think this position um, it seems pretty reasonable for black. Um, I don't think you can just crush this as white. But I do need to show it because... Uh, I think uh, it is important. Now, um, after knight takes d4, this is not you know the only move. Knight takes e5 can lead to a balanced position, but I'm here to show you two other options that you have. Um, we have the lolly variation and the Napoleon gambit. So we're gonna we're gonna go over the lolly variation real quick, very short, and then we're going to get into the very very exciting Napoleon gambit. We'll give it just a second here. Okay, knight takes on d4, knight takes on d4. Now, when I first started chess, when I was a novice, I didn't even know what openings were. This is what I would play naturally. You know, my opponent just took on d4 with the knight, I'm going to take with the knight. Or, um, you also mentioned this whenever we talk about fourth move alternatives, you can reach um, the same position after pawn takes, knight takes and then knight takes again you have queen takes d4 um so same position two different move orders there's a sideline on the third move and a line on the fourth move but they get you to the same position your queen ends up on d4 normally when the queen is on d4 it's not good because it can be punished by the move knight on b8 to c6 i don't think i need to explain to this audience why 
uh, white is able to get away with queen d4 here. Now, black has two tries. Um, I'll go over a third here, knight f6. Knight f6 looks very natural. You're developing on the king side, you're going to follow it up with some bishop move, maybe, and then castle. But this is punished immediately by pawn to e5, asking the knight, where are you going? And black does have this response, c5, attacking the queen. And if you don't know your preparation as white, this can definitely throw you for a loop, probably catch you off guard. But all you do is queen e3. Now this does allow knight d5. They're hitting your queen again. You need to go um, like queen f3, or really any queen move, I think. And now knight to b4. And you're starting to ask, you know, black, black is moving this knight a lot. But they do have a big threat, taking on c2 and winning an exchange. But here, bishop to c4, first um, developing your piece and threatening mate with queen takes f7. Pawn d5, pawn takes on d6, the en passant rule. And now queen f6 to stop the checkmate. I think white has uh, a very nice continuation with queen e3, bishop e6 to block, and bishop b5 check. The knight goes back to c6 because otherwise your king would move and you wouldn't be able to castle. Uh, and now white can capture on c5. And I think this is definitely better. White is up, what is it, two pawns in this position. d6 is, let's be honest, probably going to fall. But having the advantage of a pawn is definitely, uh, definitely gives some insurance for your position. But knight f6... I don't think is is good uh, there is d6 here and you can go knight c3 and knight f6 comes now now you can't play e5 because d6 was played so continue with bishop f4 I think the most played move here is bishop g5 but the reason I'm recommending bishop f4 is because this also mirrors some of the lines I believe I suggested in my Philidor videos and the position is actually going to look very similar to an exchange Philidor. So uh, that's why I recommend this setup here. Um, kind of looking like a Yugoslav attack again. Ideas of g4 and h4, maybe going bishop c4. Trading off the bishops shouldn't be a problem for white. And you can go from here, but I think this is very pleasant for white. But there is one more line that, uh, at least when I checked in chess base, uh, it was one of those hot moves that are up and coming. And it is knight to e7. And the point of knight to e7 is to make up for the fact this knight isn't on b8. Is It's trying to go to c6 and hit the queen. But white does have some time. So take advantage of the time. Develop your piece. And now after knight c6, you just you move the queen. e3 again. Now knight b4 comes and it's not like the knight went to d5 and it hit the queen and the queen moved now black is threatening to take on c2 and not win a rook they're trying to win the queen so you have to do something about this and you should go queen to e2 the queen defends on c2 and now black goes bishop to e7 and white can continue with bishop e3 black should go d6 trying to get out their light squared bishop on one of these squares uh, and now white will have the time to play a3 and kick the knight away. And now you can castle queenside. Black castles kingside. But now I think white's position is slightly better than what we just looked at with what looked like an exchange Philidor. Now this is starting to look a little bit more aggressive. With this pawn on f4, you may be looking at playing e5 in the future. And ideas of g4 and h4 are still possible. Um, like I should mention, I right, let's say black plays a waiting move, h4. Um, like if they ever fall for taking this, it's winning right away because of queen h5. Um, if the bishop moves, then it's checkmate. Um, so there are some very nice tricks here for white. And I think this covers the lolly variation 
I, I can't think of any other big moves by Black that deserve any recognition here. So we're going to move on to probably one of my new favorite lines in chess, the Napoleon Gambit. I went down a rabbit hole with this one, and honestly, this line probably deserves a Chess Openings Explained video of its own. Um, I was going through, and it looked like the theory... There's actually, like, not much theory here, but I was doing some engine analysis and playing some lines against uh, one of my coworkers here, and there's quite a few only moves that both sides need to know. So... We'll get our scotch here, and they take on d4. We're going to take on d4 with the knight, and after they take back with the pawn, we're not going to take on d4 with the queen. Instead, we're going to play bishop to c4, and this is known as the Napoleon Gambit, and this opening gets its name from uh, a game between Napoleon Bonaparte versus one of his generals back in 1818. Now, uh, in that game, Black decided to go bishop c5. And this is one of the first ideas of the Napoleon Gambit, is that if they go bishop c5, white is immediately winning. After bishop f7, king takes on f7, and queen h5, forking the king and the bishop. Now, in that game, uh, Napoleon did not play um, bishop f7. So I'm not going to go through that game, actually, um, but feel free to uh, look it up yourself. Um, I just think it was a very, very messy game and definitely suspicious. <laughs> but um, I was doing so, some looking around, and there's a couple ideas black can have. First off, uh, let's take a look at queen f6. Queen f6 holds on to the pawn, uh, develops the queen, and you can't really punish this, I don't think. I think after castles and knight e7, after c3 and knight c6, I think this position is pretty balanced. Um, white is slightly better uh, because you take on d4 here, and after queen takes d4, you play something like queen c2. I think this is fine for either side. Queen f6 is probably a legit move that you can play. Um, but I guess there there's two other moves we should look at. One is c5 trying to hold on to the pawn with their own pawn. But here, white doesn't really need to do much uh, that's special. They castle, black plays d5, um, trying to break up this center here, but white can just take bishop d6, and c3, trying to get them to take and recapture with the knight to develop further. Um, if you play rook e1, it looks very natural. It's actually just met by knight e7, and black is ready to castle. Um, I don't think I, I would prefer to play rook e1 and force black to block. I think I would rather have them need to spend a move to block anyway, because uh, um, I guess the tempo you gain by moving your rook, uh, black gains it back by developing their knight. Uh, so that's why I'm recommending c3. Now knight e7. And you can take on d4. After they take on d4, queen takes. And after black castles, I think white is just a healthy pawn up. I don't see any crazy way black can try and win this back right away. I guess there's like queen a5 in the future, but that can be met with knight c3. I think this is just... Um, I mean, knight c3 comes first. So I think this is just a, a nice position for white. Healthy pawn. The, the last idea, this is, this is where I went down the slippery slope, d5. d5 is, again, trying to uh, muddy the waters a little bit, and I think white should take with the bishop. White can take with either, but I think taking with the bishop is a bit nicer. And, okay, if black tries to hit the bishop, you just retreat the bishop back to b3, a natural development should get you far enough in the game. Um, we have moves like knight d2, trying to develop the knight. Queen f3. It looks like you're blocking the knight, but you're trying to go knight e4. Um, getting the bishop pair. And after a5, 
white's white has a game you can play uh sorry not a3 you can play a4 here and be fine uh develop the bishop somewhere i think d2 and then get your rooks into the center this is pretty pretty straightforward if they play c6 the real trouble comes when they play knight f6 because now they're threatening to take on d5 and win their pawn back um or maybe uh some some ideas of taking on e4 combined with queen e7 it's a little slow for that plan but it exists and here white should be content with taking the pawn all right that, that was easy we just take the pawn we're good that's it unfortunately that's not the case um black does want to try and get their pawn back and d5 is going to be their target for the next couple of moves mainly because the bishop can't move um if this bishop moves uh the queen hangs um so okay c6 looks very natural uh this is actually a blunder c6 trying to get the the bishop fails to bishop f7 and if the king takes you win the queen or if king e7 well now you just trade queens and after f3 white is just in a winning end game they're up two pawns absolutely no reason why they should lose this so okay if c6 doesn't work how are we going to put pressure on d5 we go bishop to e6 and again you cannot capture because you would hang your queen so knight to c3 just reinforcing d5 reinforcing e4 and, and now we're met with c6 because now there's no bishop to f7 and now white has to decide what to do uh, you have two options here uh, one which i guess is fine i'm not a big fan of it is queen a4 just pinning the pawn but now knight takes d5 and after ed5 bishop d5 and castles bishop e6 um black is the one with the bishop pair and it is a fairly open board and the pawns are pretty symmetrical so i think having the bishop pair is a, a nice advantage here for black now white does have the move and can start with like rook d1 this is fine but again I, I i hardly think black has any problems so rather than queen a4 a bit sharper is bishop to g5 and after bishop to g5 i think both sides need to start pay, paying attention and being accurate black should go bishop to e7 if they take the pawn right away i think white is doing just fine after e5 this knight is pinned and if you try and go bishop e7 then white is going to be winning after pawn takes bishop takes you can just trade on f6 and black's structure is not a structure this, this is just a bunch of, of targets as far as i'm concerned um or if they take with the pawn then bishop to e3 and then again uh, these are just targets it's not a pawn structure uh they're not helping each other out so um you can't really take on d5 so bishop to e7 after bishop to e7 let's see what, what do i have here in my notes we have castles so castles long you're putting more pressure on the d file and here there, there's two moves that black has um, there's queen a5 and after queen a5 there's two options that white has the first option is to uh bail out with like queen a4 um not in this position i don't believe um but uh, you take on f6 first bishop f6 e5 bishop g5 check f4 and bishop takes f4 queen f4 cd5 uh this is where they have the option they, they can bail out with queen a4 and just get like a, a equal end game or they can play king b1 and keep this alive keep the queens on the board so this is one idea um if they go queen a5 the other idea black has 
instead of going queen a5 right away, uh, probably more critical is taking on d5. And in this position, statically, uh, white is down a piece. But we're going to get it back. The only move here is ed5. Uh, after e to d5, this is similar to like um, one of those knight d5 sacrifices in the knight orf. And black cannot capture on d5. If they capture with the queen, thank you for the queen. If they capture with the bishop, uh, you take on f6. They take on f6. And queen a4 check. And this piece is falling. So you will get your minor piece back. And white is up a pawn. And now after some moves by black, you see like g6. White has this idea of h4 and h5. And just run the pawn all the way down to h6. Why don't you? After king h8, king b1. Just trying to get away from any possible checks. Queen d6, you can trade. And we'll see that we actually get into a losing uh, rook end game. White is up a pawn. This pawn's on h6, trapping the king. And it's going to be relatively simple to get these rooks to the 7th rank. So bishop takes d5 won't work. At the same time, knight takes d5 won't work because this will also lead to a losing rook end game after bishop e7. And now if knight e7, this is meant by queen takes g7. You're attacking the rook, you're attacking the queen, you cannot save both. And if rook g8 trying to trade queens, well, I'm going to take your queen and laugh and say check. So queen takes e7 is forced because of this, and now knight takes d5, bishop takes d5, and now instead of taking right away, you take on g7, hitting the rook, hitting the bishop, you're going to be winning material. Rook f8 to save the rook is met with rook d5, and now rook e5 is a threat supported by the queen, so black must play f6, and met by a queen trade, Rook to e1, king f7, and rook d7. White is killing black. King g6 and take on b7 is just disaster. So many extra pawns. So what does black do? They can't capture on d5. They're going to go for some counterplay. Queen to a5. And after queen to a5, I believe a, a nice continuation for white is bringing the rook towards the center. This is exactly like our classical Nidlorf in where, again, if black decides to try and capture, well, we run into some big problems because of this pin. The uh, the position here just is not good for black. Queen takes f6 is possible. Knight d5 is possible. There's so many, so many ways to win. Um, so that being said, black shouldn't capture on d5 with the bishop. However, in this position, they do have knight takes d5, which is one of their only moves. Actually, the only move to continue. And here, white's only move to keep an advantage is queen g7. This has the exact same idea as we've been talking about. It hits the rook. You're looking to take on d5, and if bishop takes, rook takes e7, should be winning. Um, so black needs to castle, get the king out of the center, defend the rook on h8. Um, but now there is rook takes d5. A couple things going on with this move. Um, first, knight takes c3 doesn't look too friendly. Second, after rook takes d5, you're taking the defender of e7. Uh, so it's like giving up a rook for two pieces. And black captures back. If they capture with the bishop... Uh, this is just lost after bishop takes e7. Rook takes e7 is not lost. Um, if rook takes e7, there is bishop to e6 trapping the rook back here. Uh, and what is it? I guess you go queen f6 and black starts getting active pieces, I guess. Uh, but taking with the bishop does keep up the pressure because you're hitting the rook. And after moving the rook to e8, uh, queen to e5 protecting. 
you're going to be winning this bishop back. This uh, this should be just winning, and it is. So they can't take with the bishop. They have to take with the rook. Now you take on e7, and rook to e8 is mandatory. You have to keep up the pressure. You have to stay in time with white's development and activity. So rook e8 hitting the bishop, uh, making white react is the way to go. Um, it should also be mentioned you, you definitely cannot play knight d5 because it hangs checkmate. So don't be greedy. Don't take the rook. Just defend your piece. Move it out of danger. And now rook f5 is an idea hitting the f pawn. You can just play f3. And I was going to end my analysis here. Um, but I asked myself, what is, you know, does black have any threats here? And it, black can continue the game with b5. And the idea is going b4 hitting the knight. And after the knight moves, coming in with the queen and the bishop. So white does have to respond to this. Um, b3 is good this is playable it's still much better for white but i wanted to give myself the world's biggest headache so i started analyzing rook takes e6 and taking with the rook is uh not good for black because of queen f8 the king is forced to the seventh rank and now you take on f7 so white gets another pawn and after king d6 bishop e7 white will end up winning an exchange so uh they can't really take back with the rook i was looking uh they have to take back with the pawn which looks a little scary at first because now this queen does have more influence over the board in general it keeps black's king stuck to the back rank so uh here there's also this tactic queen f7 hitting the rook and if the rook simply moves, you have queen to e6 picking up the other rook. This rook is being hit. Uh, that's just winning for for white. So black must uh, give back an exchange. And white should take the rook with check. And after just a couple more moves here, blocking with the queen. Um, I didn't want to trade queens. This is just, uh, it lends itself to black. Um, but this should be a, a draw or at least very balanced. Um, but queen takes b5 is probably white's only try left. And after queen d4 by white, I think queen to e8, king b7, queen e7, and you have to move the king back. You can't uh, do anything with the queen. You hang your queen. Uh, queen's also busy defending the rook. So I think here... Uh, this, this position has never been reached, but it looked like there were a lot of only moves, and I thought this was very exciting. I would love to see this played in a game, but I, I believe this position should be a draw. I think black is active enough, but computers are lending themselves towards white, and it looks like, um, I mean, white, oops, white does still have a few ideas with playing a, like a three, b3, um, but this probably deserves way more analysis than I can give it for our lecture here. We are 10 minutes over, um, but this is it. This is our, our first part of many parts to the Scotch game. Here's our third move sidelines. I hope you guys are excited about this gambit as I am. Um, and yeah, if you guys have any questions, um, I guess we'll, we'll give it a little bit of time here, maybe two minutes for any questions. But yeah uh will i be covering the scotch gambit too yes i will be covering the scotch gambit uh i believe that's what we're going to be looking at next week and then the lecture after that we're going to be looking at the infamous knackmanson gambit so uh we have a lot of fun exciting chess coming up over the next couple weeks here so i want to thank everyone for coming and checking out the lecture tonight and we will see you next week